Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, Israeli forces attack Palestinian mobilizations in Beta and East Jerusalem. Enquiry into the death of a 37-year-old indigenous woman in Canada concludes. Thousands protest on second anniversary of June 3rd massacre in Sudan. And in our video section, we take a look at the Senate inquiry into the Brazilian government's COVID-19 response. In our first story, local media reported that at least 113 Palestinians were injured by Israeli forces during a protest in the occupied West Bank on June 4, that's today. People from Beta, Yatma and Kabbalan had gathered to protest the construction of an Israeli settlement. Wafa News reported that settlers had set up over 20 mobile homes on the Jabal Shabai Mountains. As Palestinians gathered at the site to protest, Israeli forces started firing live ammunition and tear gas. The Red Crescent has stated that at least one person is in a critical condition. Meanwhile, Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem held a marathon in solidarity with Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan. Protesters wore t-shirts with the number 7850 to signify the number of Palestinians reportedly facing displacement. However, Israeli forces soon started firing sound bombs, tear gas and rubber bullets at people. A court had ruled on May 2nd that 13 Palestinian families from Sheikh Jarrah would be evicted by August 1st. Meanwhile, following mass protests, the High Court has postponed its verdict in the case of four families who are facing immediate eviction. Similar to Sheikh Jarrah, Palestinians in Silwan and neighboring areas are also facing forced displacement. At least 87 eviction orders have been filed against families in the Batn al Hawa neighborhood. The Naja and the Kayat al Rajabi families filed an appeal in court on May 26. However, the verdict has been effectively postponed till until December. UNRWA head Filippi Lazzarini has said that the forced removal of Palestinians from Sheikh Jarrah is a violation of international law. Speaking on June 2nd, he further stated that Palestinians were experiencing the second displacement in living memory. Meanwhile, Palestinians have organized a Palestine Economic Week starting June 6th. People are urged to boycott Israeli products and support local Palestinian producers. In our next story, an inquiry into the death of a 37-year-old indigenous woman was concluded in the Canadian province of Quebec this week. Joyce Eshaquan was died in a hospital in Joliet, September 28, 2020. Moments before her death, she live-streamed hospital staff making abusive and insulting remarks towards her. An expert witness also testified that she could have been saved if she had been monitored properly. He stated that she died of a pulmonary edema caused by an excess of fluid in the lungs. During the course of the hearings, it was revealed that doctors had misdiagnosed her as suffering from an opioid withdrawal. Joyce Eshaquan belonged to the Etikamek community nation and is survived by her husband and seven children. Thousands of people from across Quebec held rallies to demand justice for Joyce on June 2nd. The Etikamek people have also presented a series of measures called Joyce's Principle to the government. Meanwhile, the federal government released its MMIWG National Action Plan on June 3rd. This is in response to the final report of National Enquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls released in 2019. The report made 31 recommendations to address what it called a Canadian genocide. The federal plan focuses on indigenous culture, health, security and justice. It was released just days after the remains of 215 indigenous children were discovered at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Activists have argued that the federal plan does not include concrete steps, a set time frame and resource allocations. The Native Women's Association of Canada also stepped away from the national plan. Denouncing the process as toxic and dysfunctional, they stated that they were left out of the major decision-making process. The association released its own plan with 65 action points earlier this week. It includes the setting up of resiliency lodges and healing and compensation funds for victims and survivors. We now go to Sudan where thousands of protesters took to the streets of Khartoum on June 3rd. The day marked two years since the Ramadan 29 or June 3rd massacre in 2019. At the time, thousands of people had held a sit-in demonstration outside the army headquarters during the Sudanese revolution. Over 128 people were killed after armed forces led by the paramilitary rapid support forces stormed the site. The attack left around 700 people injured and there were over 70 report cases, reported cases of rape. The Sudanese transitional government set up an independent committee to investigate the violence in September 2019. The commission collected testimonies, photos and video footage of over 3,000 witnesses. However, it has repeatedly failed to present its findings on the killings. A protest was held at the site of the original sitting on the 29th day of Ramadan last month. However, security forces fired live ammunition and tear gas, killing two people and injuring at least 28. This week's protest was called by the Sudanese Professionals Association, which had read the revolution against dictator Omar al-Bashir in 2019. Protesters waved flags and demanded justice as they marched to the cabinet building and the public prosecutor's office. The transitional government, which was established after ousting Omar al-Bashir, has faced increasing criticism. The body is heavily dominated by the military and has been accused of failing to achieve the goals of the revolution. Issues such as unemployment and rising prices, which prompted the unrest in 2019, still remain unaddressed. In our final story, we take a look at the ongoing Senate inquiry into the Brazilian government's COVID-19 response. 
The proceedings have revealed that President Jair Bolsonaro failed to acquire vaccines and promoted ineffective cures for COVID-19. The government's negligence also led to severe oxygen crisis in Manaus, where patients died of asphyxiation. Here's a video feature from Brazil de Fato on the Senate inquiry's findings so far. The Parliamentary Commission on the Pandemic has revealed that the Bolsonaro administration's disastrous policies were coordinated by a group of informal advisors that have been in cahoots with the government since the beginning of the health crisis. Known as the Parallel Cabinet, the group is supposedly comprised of physicians, entrepreneurs, and people close to the president, who work to spread the government's negationist arguments and practices, such as herd immunity and the use of medications with no proven efficacy against the coronavirus. The government rises to power with this anti-system narrative, the idea that there is nothing trustworthy within the system, thus the Parallel Cabinet. It's a group of people who are not necessarily tied to government posts, but who uphold the ideological and Puritan matrix that are the pillar that brought this post to power and that outline the issues they raise. Among the most influential players in the parallel cabinet who were cited in the hearings are businessman Carlos Wizard, owner of a language school chain, Congressman Osmar Terra, who stated that social distancing increases the number of COVID cases, and Mayara Pinheiro, Secretary of Labor Relations and Education in the Health Ministry, who is known as Captain Hydroxychloroquine. The group's actions supposedly influenced the firing of two health ministers, Enrique Mandetta and Nelson Teich. In statements to the commission, both mentioned the existence of the cabinet. For example, there was an unstamped presidential decree on the table suggesting that the label on chloroquine packages be changed by Anvisa, Brazil's product and services regulatory agency, to state that the medication's use was recommended for the treatment of the coronavirus. For infectologist Raquel Stucci, if the health ministry's policies hadn't been guided by this group, Today, the scenario could be vastly different. Had we talked to Pfizer in August, I believe that would be close to having 70% of people vaccinated. I believe we would match what Europe is experiencing today, already being able to go outside without using masks. But I think we're going to be delayed for another year. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Thank you.